this week on the Back Table Podcast. It's very tempting to also just involve your team. And so, you know, if you say, okay, I want to change and create an algorithm, let's sit down with all the surgeons in a room and come to consensus. But the realization is that there are a whole list of stakeholders outside of the surgical team that really need to be involved. We have, you know, our nurses who are in pre-post are the ones providing the guidance to the families and are telling them things. And so involving them as stakeholders helps kind of deliver that message in standardized care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with a hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. My name is Gopi Shah. I'm a pediatric ENT, and I have two very special guests and colleagues with me today. I have Dr. Jennifer Laven and Dr. Anthony Shane, and they are here to talk about developing a perioperative pathway for pediatric otolaryngology. Dr. Jennifer Laven is an associate professor in otolaryngology at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. She practices at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. She's the director of quality and safety for the Division of Pediatric Otolaryngology. Jen was on Backtable ENT episode 14, Quality and Safety in Pediatric ENT. I also have Dr. Anthony Shane. He's an associate professor in otolaryngology at the University of Tennessee, Memphis at Le Bonaire Children's Hospital. Dr. Shane is also the chief of ENT at St. Jude's Hospital, leading the pediatric thyroid and pediatric head to neck cancer teams. Tony was on Backtable ENT episode 49, Building Centers of Excellence for Pediatric Head and Neck Tumors, and recently on episode 123, Health Equity Research for Pediatric Head and Neck Cancers. Welcome to the show, Tony and Jen. How are you guys? Great. Thank you. Great, Gopi. Great to be back here. <laughs> Can we first uh, have you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves and your practice for maybe some of the guests that don't know you guys? So yes, I'm um, Jennifer Laven. I am, uh, as Gopi said, a pediatric otolaryngologist at Lurie Children's Hospital. I head up the uh, quality and safety work in the division and also in the hospital where I do larger projects such as developing dashboards for the entire hospital, as well as uh, helping with rolling out the organization as a high reliability organization. And I am Tony Shane. I am still a pediatric laryngologist at St. Jude Children's and Lavonard Children's Hospitals. And while I don't do nearly as much as QI work as Jen does, my role as chief is try to help standardize care across all my faculty to make it easier for kids to receive the same level of care and to make it easier for everybody around the hospital to provide the same same level of care without having eight different ways of doing things. And that's something I learned in fellowship. In terms of um, quality improvement, um, Tony, you said it's something that you learned a little bit in fellowship. I, I can't recall doing very much quality improvement stuff in my residency training. I don't really know if in medical school, it was even a buzzword at that time. And maybe we were just getting into it in fellowship, you and I are just a year apart. We both did our fellowships at UT, at Southwestern in Dallas. How did you get interested into it and kind of what makes you kind of keep doing the work? Well, a lot of it was pretty simple and it kind of started when Dr. Mitchell was trying to get everybody to provide the same amount of eardrops to, uh, which is kind of silly, but like somebody has three drops for three days, four drops for a seven days, five, and that can be confusing. And what's the actual treatment and Cyprodex can be quite expensive. So like, is somebody going through it too much? Is somebody not going through it enough? Are we setting people up for failure? So he basically showed everybody that this is the way to do it, 525. And that's what I kind of have everybody doing at, at my hospitals. And that's not necessarily a, a care pathway, but that's standardizing something that's a compromise, like it's not too much, it's not too little, it's right in the middle. And that's really what a care pathway is, is to provide the best option. So everybody is kind of doing the same thing. And it is more of a guideline than a law. But when you have somebody, something there is like when you have a new PACU nurse come in, that PACU nurse will know exactly what to do because everybody does the same thing rather than having new people coming in to the system and having to learn again, eight different ways of doing things, which can lead to significant complications and issues. Yeah. And Jen, you've had a little bit more formal education in quality and safety. Is that correct? Can you tell us a little bit about your training and your interest and in how it developed? 
Yeah, so it started originally in my fellowship training. I worked with Dr. Rahul Shah from Children's National Medical Center, who was the chief quality officer um, at that hospital. And so he mentored me through my initial experience in quality and safety. And I decided from that experience to pursue a master's degree in healthcare quality and patient safety through Northwestern University. And I've then subsequently used that master's degree. That's great. So, Tony, you had mentioned care pathways, try to find the best options, and it's more of a a guideline. Can you guys expand a little bit more on, you know, I think of an algorithm. Is that the same thing? Is it different? And sort of ultimate goals of what a care pathway tries to do. It's a name, an algorithm, and a care pathway, I think, can be used interchangeably. And as an engineer by undergraduate training, that makes sense to me. A doesn't work, go to B. If B doesn't work, go to C. So you have fail safes in place. I think also one of the things that I see as a care pathway at Lurie Children's, we actually call these clinical care guidelines. And the way that I see it is in addition to the algorithm, you can find other ways to standardize and hardwire your interventions. And so, for example, with our adenotonsillectomy care pathway or clinical care guideline, We have standardized the post-operative requirements for discharge, what age cutoff is for patients being able to receive opioids, et cetera. And then in order to hardwire that, we implemented order sets that default. So if a patient is under age five, for example, opioids do not come up as an option to prescribe as part of the order set. Whereas if they're over age five, it's not automatically selected. There is an option to select it. And so if I had a patient under age five and I wanted to prescribe opioids, I would have to first enter the order set and then go in and put the order in separately. And by creating that extra step, it can help drive change because it kind of makes it easy to do the quote right thing and it makes it more work to do the wrong thing. And what we found is our rates of opioid prescriptions under under age five went from 60% to less than 10% through this intervention. And so, you know, you identified a process problem or, you know, for the specific example, it was discharges after TNA. And Tony, you'd mentioned the, you know, number of drops after ear tubes and how different surgeons had a different number of drops uh, after ear tubes. How do you get people to see that this is something that you find benefit in in creating sort of a a standardized process? Is that difficult? Who do you need buy-in from and how do you propose or pitch it? So I think the biggest thing with getting buy-in, and, I, and I've said this a few times when I give talks on this, everyone is like, oh, great. Yes, I agree. Let's standardize care to my way. Um, and so getting people to change is, I think, one of the hardest things. One of the ways to drive change is to really understand the distribution of practice. And so you could take it as an approach with a top-down decree. However, again, it's harder to get buy-in for a top-down decree. I find what is easier, especially because, you know, I am not a division head. I am, you know, I'm someone who is, when I rolled this out, a relatively new member of the team. In order to get that buy-in, what I did is I said, well, here is the distribution of our practice. And if we bring it to the middle, how does that sound? And so, you know, it's funny because when I write this up, a lot of the times, People may say, well, why did you pick this? It's somewhat arbitrary. And I'm like, well, that's kind of what quality is, is this is what was able to achieve consensus. And so, yes, there's no evidence to say that five-year-olds are the good cutoff for using opioids. But we had people who gave it up to seven, eight. We had people with no age limit. You know, we had people not giving it at all. And so this was how we achieved consensus. Yeah, that's interesting that you say it's a little arbitrary. And, you know, I think any time that there is sort of consensus statements and the even the ones that are maybe not your clinical pathway, but, you know, the published consensus recommendations or guidelines for whatever it is, tongue tied to, you know, the CF guidelines for ENT, it's with the information that you have. And then it's a group of people that help decide, well, this is information that we have. How do we want to, which direction do we want to take or what can we pull from this? And so when you're, are there certain key steps or issues that to address How do you develop the actual step-by-step when you're creating a pathway? How do you think about it? How many people, you know, who else do you get involved to help you come up with this? So I think the biggest thing is it's very tempting to also just involve 
your team. And so, you know, if you say, okay, I want to change and create an algorithm, let's sit down with all the surgeons in a room and come to consensus. Um, But the realization is that there are a whole list of stakeholders outside of the surgical team that really need to be involved. We have, you know, our nurses who are in pre-post are the ones providing the guidance to the families and are telling them things. And so involving them as stakeholders helps kind of deliver that message in standardized care. You know, we have pharmacists who are also involved who might be able to speak to ideal pain regimens and ideal formulations of things because of availability in the market, et cetera. We might have our clinic nurses involved because they're the ones who are fielding phone calls and saying, you know what, if you prescribe that, those patients are calling all the time or something like that. And so, you know, you really need to think, you know, who is everyone who comes into contact with the patient pertaining to this care and who do I need to include? We also included anesthesiologists in this because they do the intake. So we had our anesthesia nurse practitioners who do the intake on the day of surgery, as well as anesthesiologists who are providing the care uh, intraoperatively. And um, when you came up with, you know, the stakeholders involved, I mean, you know, I love that you, you talk about the PACU nurse, you talk about the anesthesiologist, everybody that's sort of involved. How do you know that you have everybody involved before you roll something out? Who do you get feedback from? You know, I, I think about some of the consensus statements or the guidelines that have come out from the, our academy or ASPO. You know, sometimes they'll, you know, send it to the members and have like an open comment time where you can take a look at it and say, oh, yeah, you know, what about this? Or this is a great point. Who else do you maybe get feedback from afterwards just to double check? Is that a thing? No, I think, well, one of the things that we do on the front end is what we call sort of pain point interviews. And that's where you go through and people just clear the air with what their frustrations are. And you can actually find out a lot from those interviews. And then that also helps guide who you want on your team, because if someone is identifying a pain point, they may say, hey, you know what, I would also actually involve these people because this is a problem that they may be able to to weigh in on. You know, I mean, I think we involve schedulers even for some of our care pathways. So administrative staff sometimes is, is who involved. And so I think just by going through and just saying, what is what is the the pebble in your shoe? about this process, then that that helps. You all seem to be pretty fluid because you don't know who everybody needs to be involved and you don't know if what you're putting out there is the best thing. So you have to be willing to change and kind of roll with the punches. I'm glad you brought that up. How often do you measure or go back and take a look like, hey, is this pathway working? Where do I need to flex? Uh, one of my roles as division chief is I actually go through data on a monthly basis. One is like, how many cases are we doing? What do we need to be doing better? What's to put through clinic? So I, I go through it monthly. That may be overkill, but that's just one of the things that I do. And then I make little changes. And then like as my own personal practice, I change something that I do every six months. One that that forces me to keep up with the current literature keeps me interested in my job. So you just need to keep up and be willing to make changes on the fly. And when you do make adjustments, for example, you know, we keep the kids in, you know, PACU for two hours. And let's say you need to change it to three hours, or maybe you're keeping them in PACU for three hours. And you know what, actually, most of our kids go home within two. How do you then get everybody on the same page to make that adjustment into the pathway now that's settled in? Because once people kind of get settled in a pathway, it's kind of getting everybody to keep, to flex when appropriate. Are there challenges with that? Well, I think I, that's also pretty fluid, something I picked up from fellowship because we watched our kids for 90 minutes at a minimum and three hours at a maximum. And if they needed to be there for longer than three hours, they would automatically be admitted. Now, if by like 12 hours later they were doing fine, then yeah, we would send them home. But I think having that flexibility And time points in there allows you to not really make too many changes and allows you the flexibility to decide what to do. I don't send anybody home after a tonsillectomy in under 90 minutes. And nobody goes home if they were longer there for three hours, because that means they need to stay longer. And I don't want them taking up that packy bed. They need to be admitted. So it sounds like when you make the pathway, you got to give a little range so that people can kind of do what they need to within that range as well. Do you feel like when you have a pathway, can the same pathway work in different settings? You know, y'all are both at pretty large tertiary quaternary care freestanding children's hospitals. I'm sure people reach out probably and say, hey, you know, um, 
I'm at a hospital that does, it's not a freestanding children's hospital. We do a good number of TNAs, but it's, you know, it's not the freestanding. Does the clinical care setting, how does that affect a clinical pathway that you may come up with? Or where does the setting come into place when you think of a clinical care pathway? I think for the adenotonsillectomy one, it's not as you know, site specific. I mean, I think what you can do is you can kind of look at someone's algorithm and say, you know, is this feasible in my institution or in my setting? I think with some of the more advanced algorithms, you may have to do a little bit more modifying. But I think having that foundation and at least the basic flow chart of things of the algorithm can help guide you if you're at a different institution and you can always modify to fit the setting that you're in. We've talked about setting and we have a high volume procedure like a TNA. What about uh, different patient populations? Do you find that pathways have to, is that another variable or something, you know, another factor that you look at when you come up with some of these pathways? So for us, the algorithm really applies. So we have, you know, there's the option of patients going home versus being admitted. The admission criteria is kind of outside the algorithm for us. And so I think, and this is one of the things that we have to explain with buy-in as people will always mention, you know, well, what about this really complex craniofacial patient? How are you going to apply this to that? And I think my response to that is whenever you put in an algorithm, you shoot for like 70 to 80 percent adherence. And realize that there are always going to be outliers and say, you know what, you are a physician, you've been trained as a physician, you have the capability to recognize, you know, this patient has some sort of special need that makes me need to intentionally deviate from the algorithm. And that's fine. Yeah, I'm glad you made that point. I was going to ask you, do you find that clinical care pathways uh, work mostly for high volume procedures or Do you find that clinical, how do clinical care pathways come into play when it's, for example, maybe Tony and pediatric head and neck, you know, which may not be as common? So we actually have a couple of protocols, not necessarily for head and neck, but we have an invasive fungal sinusitis pathway where everybody, and I've gotten multiple calls from multiple institutions about questions about this, so. Basically, all of our, uh, a lot of our kids are placed on um, antifungals when they start uh, chemotherapy for whatever reason. And then we have certain things that they need to hit to trigger a consultation. Uh, one fever for a long time, symptoms or signs like uh, rhinorrhea, epistaxis, facial numbness. Their ANC has been below 600 for several days. And then we, uh, ENT comes in and we scope them. And then if we see something, we go to the operating room with uh, imaging. And then we debride every, if we have a positive, we debride every 72 hours until we either reverse the immunosuppression, which often happens, or until uh, we get clear negative margins. Again, with not too much morbidity. And again, our survival is much, much higher than the national average. Unless these kids are on their way to passing because of their disease, they don't pass specifically due to the invasive fungal sinusitis, uh, which I think the current mortality rate nationally is about 50% due to the disease. And our hit rate is actually very, very high. I can't even remember the last time that we had a negative biopsy. You know, because we adhere strictly to that protocol. And I mean, I can't absolutely take credit for this because this started in the early 2000s while I was not even a medical student. And there have been, I can count on one hand how many times there has been orbital or brain involvement from invasive fungal sinusitis at our institution. And the other protocol we have is decannulation because a lot of our head neck patients get a trach, not because they're on the vent, but because they need it for treatment, either prophylaxis or what have you. So when a decision is made to make a trach, we get consulted a week before. Uh, The parents start getting training a week before. We do the procedure. They usually get woken up and get moved to the floor within 24 to 48 hours. They do their treatment. Once treatment is completed, they get evaluated by me. Uh, or one of my partners, and then if everything looks okay, they get decannulated. And we have like, we have something called the trach train, where we give everybody a MEPA Memphis, 
and they start at St. Jude and then end up at our uh, famous pyramid. And that's where they get decannulated. And then when we decannulate them, we throw confetti, which may not be the best thing with an open stoma, but we make sure to throw confetti far away from them. But that's actually led to very, uh, <laughs> very quick decannulations and very quick trick procedures to get these kids taken care of and decannulated in a rapid fashion. And that was one that I participated in creating and we had all the players put in at this at the same time and hasn't really needed to have much modification through the years. I'm glad you brought up those examples, Tony, because I think of the invasive fungal sinusitis protocol, which was very helpful, you know, because it, you know, we're not over scoping, we're not not scoping enough. And if we're going to the OR, we're not taking kids too much or getting there too late. But what I sometimes would find is that for some of these where it's not as common, you have to remember where you put the protocol or you have to remember sort of how it went again. Any tips for like, hey, keep it to keep everybody on the same page for something that may not be as common as a reminder? I don't know if that's a, the right... I'm going to let Jen talk about this because this was one of her initiatives as leader of the QI ASPO committee is to create a database of these protocols where anybody in our specialty could look and follow them. Yeah. So speaking you know, nationwide, we do have... So if you look at the um, ASPO website um, under one of the re under resources in the ASPO re website, you can actually find uh, a lot of these care algorithms that other institutions have submitted. And so if you're looking to build one, you can look there uh, and see what's already been done so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Speaking within the institution, specifically, you know, to your point about when something is rare, people may not realize that the algorithm exists. There are things you can do and tools you can use to highlight an algorithm. So for example, if we have a patient who has ingested a button battery or is concerned for ingesting a button battery, we see maybe, I don't know, two, three a year. Fortunately, it's very, very low um, at Lurie. And so if a patient comes in with that and has a complaint of having swallowed a possible coin, for example, or they're swallowing some sort of foreign body, the triage nurse enters in the chief complaint, and then it actually triggers a best practice advisory, uh, alerting the triage nurse to the fact that there is a pathway on this, as well as when a patient goes back to the, to the room and the provider logs in, that best practice advisory is also alerting the, the person of the algorithm. Similarly, for our single-stage laryngotracheal reconstruction patients, we have order sets or we have alerts that say that it is on a pathway. And there's a little banner on the side that says that it's part of a pathway to highlight the fact that the pathway exists. But again, what we're doing is then leveraging our technology and working with our clinical informatics team to be able to build those alerts. Yeah, I'm glad you made that point. That's a really great point of using the technology that we have. So for example, for the IFS consult, if somebody puts it in, it pops up the guideline of when to consult ENT or whoever it pops up. And then for you, when it comes in, you know, when the consult comes in, perhaps that pops up. So I think that's a great point. You also mentioned the role of ASPO uh, for our listeners. Uh, that's the American Society of Pediatric Otolaryngology. Tell me a little bit about the role of a national society when it comes to care pathways. So I think the role is multifactorial. I think that, you know, obviously we have our clinical practice guidelines and so we can drive what the showing our membership what the data suggests as the proper care for a patient. When there's not solid data, then what I see are building a repository for different pathways so people can find out what is ideal in their setting is, is another opportunity uh, when that data just isn't there. And then for um, any listeners who are looking for some resources uh, or who are interested in creating a care pathway or getting more information on quality and safety, what kind of what resources do you guys use or recommend? Uh, so the American College of Surgeons has some QI resources, as does ASPO. But really, when you're trying to create a care pathway, you just need to figure out what it, it's much like product development. Figure out what the problem is and look for a solution, but don't do it by yourself get a group of people together who work on that problem and you can create a pathway and you never know, you may create something that doesn't exist and help a bunch of people around the country. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add is do your due diligence, 
see what the literature shows. Make sure that you're completely up to date on the literature. Look at other care pathways, either through the ASPO site or many institutions also publish their care pathways or algorithms on their own institutional site. Review those. And then again, do your pain point interviews to get consensus. Thank you both so much for coming on. Any final points that perhaps I missed or that you'd like to add to the to the episode? I think the only thing that I would like to add, and again, this is sort of speaking to Tony's initial comments pertaining to the drops, is you also need to really consider how patient-centered standardized care is. If I am telling a patient, say, for example, we'll use the drops example. Say I do, you know, four drops twice a day for seven days and someone does three drops twice a day for five days, et cetera. My residents are working with 13 surgeons. They may not completely remember which physician does which thing. And so I might go out and talk to the family and say, this is, I want to do four drops twice a day for seven days, for example. And then there may be, you know, the resident may write another doctor's thing because they forget that that's what I do. And then the nurse explaining the discharge instructions may forget and explain yet another thing. And you have to realize to the patient how that comes across in the optics of that. And so they may see it as, wow, everyone's telling me a different thing. No one is talking to each other. Everyone's disorganized. No one knows what they're doing. And it really comes across poorly. And so by standardizing care with all of our different prescriptions and everything, then you're re- you're ensuring that everyone is relaying a unified message and it just seems to get everything to be gelled together better. And so when we implemented our TNA algorithm, our patient satisfaction scores went up and specifically the score about is there good communication between doctors and nurses went up appreciably. And I'm sure that that was a big driver of it. It also makes taking call if you have a large group a lot easier because you don't have to think about like, what would Jen do for her patient? And you just know that's that's what your group's policy is and you just go with it. And while being patient-centric and taking care of patients is our primary goal, I think taking the stress of being on call will make us all happier, healthier, and actually more efficient clinicians. Yeah, those are both great points. I actually have one last question. When you create a pathway, is there an alert or how how do you, you know, recommend to the clinician to know when to get off of a pathway? Uh, Maybe the clinical scenario isn't fitting the pathway anymore or when to stick with it. Like, hey, the patient's going to be okay. This is this is the pathway. Is there any built in checkpoints like that to help a physician when they're not sure when to stay on or get off of the pathway? I try not to be too prescriptive about that because, again, I think one of the pieces of pushback that I receive with rolling out these algorithms is, you know, I am a physician. I am not, you know, a robot. I'm not protocol, you know. And so I think that giving them the ability, giving the physician the ability to use clinical judgment when appropriate is fine. And I think if you know, I mean, when, whenever we roll out something, we have measures for which we're tracking. We're tracking, you know, opioid use, length of stays, you know, returns to ER, you know, et cetera, as different measures. And as we track these measures, and then also, you know, for example, utilize process measures such as utilization of the order sets, et cetera. And so if I have a person, I haven't really run into this, but hypothetically, if I had someone who is an outlier who never followed the protocol, I would have that data in front of me and I can speak to that, obviously not in an accusatory way, but just being like, hey, I notice that you are deviating from the protocol a lot more than your peers. Are there reasons for it? Do you find challenges with the protocol? What is driving that? And I think that that is a good way to approach it as opposed to creating an algorithm for when it's appropriate to leave the algorithm, if that makes sense. Well, thank you both so much for coming on. If any of our audience wanted to reach out to you guys, are y'all on any social media or is there a good way to connect? All of our emails are available through Academy or Onspo. Yeah. I say, I'm, I'm happy to receive any emails. That sounds great. I learned a ton and I think it's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. 
If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor Spurgeon Hess and Yvonne Orvijinsky. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.